Hi everyone, welcome to the Improving Productivity in 2020 webinar. My name's Kate McCarthy and I'm with the Northwest Local Land Services as a Livestock Officer. And today we're going to be having the presenter Brett Smith, who I'll give a bit of an introduction to in a minute. But thank you for all joining. I hope it's a valuable um, webinar for you and I'm sure you'll get um, something out of it given Brett's experience. So, um, um, essentially a little rundown of um, what local land services does is that we're here to connect with people and groups to provide information and support um, landholders to improve agricultural productivity and to help you better manage your, um, your natural resources. So we're able to provide support and information um, as well as resources to improve your agricultural productivity, um, can control, declare um, pests and meet your legal obligations and manage and improve our natural resources. But um, one thing that I probably is a bit of a key message and especially as myself as a livestock officer is to let um, you as producers know that we're still very um, accessible at the moment. So we're still very reachable through our phone numbers and, and email addresses and our offices are still, you can access our office through an appointment, which you would do through a 1300 number but you can access that through our website if you are interested. But if you have any inquiries or anything as you would normally, we're definitely still available via telephone. So some things for, some things for tonight's webinar. Um, we'll have some polling questions, which I'll, I'll go through in a second. Most of you are probably very familiar with how webinars work, but all attendees will be are, are automatically muted so we can't hear you but um, if you are wanting to put some questions towards um, for Brett to answer then there's a question panel up on the right hand side of your screen and you'll see a tab that you can scroll down to select questions and just pop your questions in there and I'll aim to ask those questions to Brett towards the end of the webinar. Um, a survey will be sent to you after the webinar in a in a short email. So I would, I would really appreciate your time to to fill out that survey because it really helps us, and especially at the moment when we're trying different ways of engagement, um, it really helps us to know what you as producers are wanting to hear about. And like usual, there will be a recording available. So um, just a couple of things before I start the poll. Myself, like just introduce myself. Um, I'm a livestock officer and would usually be based out of Narrabri. Um, have spent some time in the Central Tablelands with their local land services and previous to that was working in South Australia in as a livestock consultant with their um, uh, primary industries and regions. So I um, yeah, have a passion for, for cattle and sheep and, and really enjoy working with producers in the Northwest region. So yeah, um, definitely feel free to email me or call me after this. But as for now, um, I'm going to put through some polling questions. So you'll see them up in your screen. If you could just click the answer, which most, most suits you, and then we'll be able to get a result, which everyone will see. So I'll just launch our first poll. So the question is, what is your involvement with the livestock industry? And if you could just select one, um, and we'll give give a bit of time to, to answer that. Seventy percent of participants have answered. One more minute. And three. Two, one. So we've got 59% um, which are sheep producers. We have some cattle producers that are interested in the sheep industry. We've got 9% of students and LLS, New South Wales government agency and 14% other. So our next poll, I'll just launch now. 
So where are you listening from in New South Wales or anywhere else in Australia? If yes, in the Northwest, just click yes. Um, if somewhere else in New South Wales, pop that in or no for another state. A couple more minutes, seconds. And three, two, one. So a lot of um, listeners are from the Northwest and some from other areas of New South Wales. So the thing about these polls, it just helps us to get a bit of an idea where you guys are coming from and gives Brett a bit of an idea as to what what um, direction he can put, um, move his PowerPoint. So second last poll, how many head of livestock are you currently managing? A couple more seconds. In three, two, one. I'll just share that that poll there. So we've got a bit of a range, but most people, 50, 57% of um, listeners are over that 1,000 head mark. So that's interesting. And the very last poll, to help give Brett a bit of an idea, and this is sort of targeted around what you know, what you're thinking at the moment, and what your direction might be. Um, so, what would your preferred method of rebuilding, or what would it look like, or what what are you working on at the moment? And this is probably more so directed at the the sheep producers listening in. So, a couple more seconds. And three, two, one. Excellent. So, yeah, that, that um, really gives us an idea that people are definitely looking to improve reproduction rates with what they have at the moment and improve their breeding stock and yeah, a bit of restocking to trade, which is definitely seen, we've seen a bit of at the moment. And yeah, the introducing breeding sheep, which has also been something that we're seeing a bit of at the moment. So definitely very interesting to guide Brett's presentation tonight. So that's the last of the polls. Um, I'll now introduce Brett. So um, Brett Smith is, um, like you would have heard and hopefully seen through the media, is a district wool manager for Elders and he covers the northwest New South Wales area and southern Queensland. He's been around the merino sheep all his life, growing up on the family farm at St George in Queensland, which he is still involved with at the moment. Brett's now based from Tamworth while still covering Walgett, Canamble and into Queensland. Brett has worked with Elders for five years now. And in a part of his role with elders, he's facilitated programs such as lifetime new management and partial profit, which has allowed him to provide additional services to clients on top of the traditional clip preparation and wool marketing. This has allowed Brett to assist clients to help improve productivity and now with the required rebuilding of the merino flock. In 2017, he was lucky enough to be awarded the National Wool Broker of the Year, as well as the 2017 Elders Employee of the Year. But Brett sees a really strong future for merinos in both wool and meat production, which with improved reproduction rates from greater lamb survival and weaner management, the full genetic potential of flocks can be realized. So I'm gonna hand it over to Brett um, from now and we can hear about everything that he's got, got to say. So I'll just pass it on to you now, Brett. Yep, thanks, Kate. Yep, no worries. There, how's that look? Yep, looks good. 
No worries. Right in. Um, well, yeah, thanks Thanks very much for the introduction, Kate. And um, thanks, everyone, for coming on tonight. Um, hopefully, I haven't drawn you away from Tiger King or anything um, anything good like that. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, yeah, make sure you yeah, ask plenty of questions towards the end and no such thing as a, as a silly question. So, and yeah, good to see a lot of um, pretty keen sheep users online. So, um, it should change now. Yep. Uh, yeah, as Kate said, yeah, yeah, work for elders as a district wool manager. Um, yeah, spent about um, nine, nearly nine years in Walgett, working mainly for elders. Um, but yeah, still involved with the family farm at St George, and yeah, done some of the industry programs um, such as lifetime year management, which is gave me a pretty good grounding in helping people improve reproduction and now rebuilding their flocks. And um, yeah, as Kate mentioned, I was lucky enough to receive the yeah, National Wool Broker of the Year Award in 2017, and that was due recognition to some of the work I'd done outside my my core role. Um, as as a wool broker with with elders, so um, so it was pretty exciting. Um, I've been done a bit with the Northwest LLS uh, with the ag extension team um, with Kate and her colleagues, and I used to be involved on the CAG, the Community Advisory Group. So I've got a yeah pretty good working relationship with the Northwest LLS. So. Um, yeah, and the theme tonight probably look at two parts. One is uh, obviously with coronavirus, there's been plenty of volatility um, within the wool market. And then the second part will be rebuilding, controlling what you can um, on farms. So, um, yeah, so I'll start into it. Obviously, yeah, the impact of the coronavirus is yeah, pretty well known. There's been a lot of volatility in all the, um, the markets just due to, due to lack of confidence and, and different things reflecting that, such as interest rates going down again. Uh, oil prices went into the negative there earlier this week and, you know, the price of cotton has been impacted because essentially, you know, with the movement restrictions uh, in, in, in a lot of the major um, countries, there's, you know, it's impacting retail because people aren't out shopping and also the movement of the processed wool. Once, once they process the greasy wool in China, there is a backlog in the system trying to move anything further, particularly into Europe, and then even, you know, exporting garments to, to the US and places like that. So it's still, um, you know, it's still, still a long way to go there once once the economy frees up. Uh, sheep meat probably hasn't been impacted so much. Uh, lamb prices have been a little bit up and down, but the domestic demand for lamb is helping that. Um, I think it's just down to the fact a little bit more people are at home cooking and, uh, you know, storing meat away in freezers, things like that. Uh, mutton prices are really strong still, and I think that's more a reflection of supply uh, with with the rain we've had and the way the sheep flock has has decreased. So it's so overall, but but things are changing daily, so it's yeah it's hard to know, and that's probably the biggest worry is we're just not sure how long this will this will go on for. So it's just a matter of um yeah one one step at a time at the moment. Uh, volatility in the wool market is probably nothing new. It is considered to be one of the most volatile commodities in the world. And as you can see on this graph, all the you know major micron indicators since uh, the start of this financial year, which has been our uh, selling current selling season. As you can see, there's been some ups and downs, coming off some really really solid prices back uh, July August last year, um, and we've seen a few dips. And you know the wool market falling this time has been uh, seen as, as more of a you know a, a bigger bigger issue than but it is only getting it's only just gone a bit lower than where a lot of the indicators went back in September uh, when when we went into a bit of free fall with the trade war in China um, and as you can see there's been some solid recoveries and I still feel the fundamentals of the wool market are, are strong to to see a recovery it's just knowing how how long that'll that'll take. Um, overall, wool probably, you know, wool, wool is a demand dri driven commodity at the end of the day. Um, if you've got strong demand, the market will move, whereas lack of supply won't always uh, necessarily drive it, um, which is probably what we're seeing exactly happening at the moment. The supply situation hasn't changed one little bit, but the demand has fallen away, so, uh, which is why the, the wool market's gone in the direction it has. 
Um, because at the end of the day, wool is a discretionary product. People only buy it when they're feeling, you know, that they've got extra extra cash, feeling feeling good. Um, and, you know, there's plenty of things people buy, unfortunately, before they purchase a woolen garment. So, And, you know, the downturn in the wool market is it, often when there's a big downturn economically, uh, we do see a downward trend in the market. So, like, GFC in 2008, SARS in about 2003, and essentially any, you know, global recessions. Um, historically, wool prices are good because, obviously, there was a, a tough period there through the 1990s. Um, in the last five years, has been really solid, but we, we're sort of back to where we were in 2015. And essentially, the recovery will be based around global confidence and once the world can start operating again. Um, so that's, one, once again, a bit of the unknown. Um, but, I, you know, it still feels the fundamentals of the wool market haven't haven't changed, except the demand, demand piece has slowed right down. Um, here, this is a pretty good graph that covers the last 20 years, looking at the Eastern Market Indicator. Um, in a couple of currencies. Uh, in Aussie dollars, we're still travelling. You know, obviously, we've come off the highs of, uh, you know, sort of about 18 months, two years ago. But historically, as you can see, we're still travelling at not a not a bad level. Um, and then in US terms, luckily, the currency depreciating has buffered us a fair bit um, in Australia. Um, so in US terms, wool is still relatively cheap. Um, which is what, what most will get traded in in US dollars. So I see that um, gives us a good opportunity to, to bounce off that. Uh, yeah, so once, you know, the future, I do see will, will, it's always bounced back. It always has come good again. Um, there's plenty of doomsday people out there saying, this is, you know, the end is near, but, uh, the fund, yeah, once again, the fundamentals of will haven't changed, um, particularly, you know, wool still the natural fibre, a clean green product that's in demand. The image that wool has with consumers is changing, and that's probably where it's, you know, marketed as merino and seen as a modern fibre that's really, you know, sustainable and, and what people want to wear. Uh, and the demand for traceability that that I can't see that disappearing once we get back back to a bit of normality, because people still, you know, there's a sector of society you still want to purchase garments and goods that are produced in a responsible manner and they want to know where, where it comes from. So at the end of the day, the positive attributes are still there for, for wool and, and that's including the supply. The supply of wool is not going to rapidly increase even though we've had a break in the season and there is a swing back into sheep. There's still plenty of competing competing uh, products to be produced from, from the flock. Um, so, so overall, I, I still feel it is very solid going ahead. We've just got to get get through some of this current situation. Um, so moving forward, I think part of it is, you know, expectations have probably got to change and knowing what you need to achieve when you sell wool um, and what prices will, you know, are required to keep keep you operating. Um, so that, that's, you know, your cost of production is a big thing that, um, you know, no, no one likes doing any more time in the office than they have to, but I still feel if you know what your cost of production is, you can give you a good guide on what, what what return you can make from growing wool and where to make investments in, in your flock and, and in productivity. And and, no, and that's probably the start of your, your marketing strategy. Uh, next thing's cash flow. At the end of the day, cash flow is king. Everyone's got bills to pay, got you know interest to pay, even though interest rates are low. Uh, you, you've got to look at that. So I think that's knowing. And when you require that income, wool is relatively easy and, and cheap to store compared to its value, in my opinion. So knowing when you need money and if you're, you know, planting crops and doing things or, you know, just knowing when you need that income to come in, I think is a big thing because you can line, you know, if you've got wool in store, you can line up your wool sales, you know, weeks, months in advance. I've got people who've got wool booked in to sell 1st of July because they want to, you know, wait for a new financial year. And in doing that, if you know you've got a set date you've got to sell wool by, um, there are, you know, options. You can still lock in wool even if you've got physically got it on hand. And, and look at that. So there's different options out there and you know, it just gives you a chance to put a floor in, in what you do. So, and then, and then the value of, um, you know, storing it once again, it is a pretty cheap commodity to store and, and it's probably the opportunity cost in storing it. If you've got, you know, if you've got to borrow money to keep going while waiting for the wool market, I feel that, you know, may not be the, the right direction. So, but just, just understand what it will cost you to store it besides the physical storage fees.
Uh, yeah, so forward marketing, and it's probably an opportunity that you know you could say we we missed a little bit coming out of this, probably because people were concerned about their level of production, and and the way the market fell was pretty rapid, so it did keep, catch a lot of people off guard. Um, but you know, there's, there's plenty of strategies, and that's either selling selling forward or, or selling backwards. So waiting for the wool market to come to the level you want, or when you require income or looking at different forward selling. And there's a couple of product common products out there. The option forwards or basis contracts where you essentially lock in a price um, and then you, you know, if the market falls, you, you come out in the money, but if the market rises, um, you do have to make a difference on some of it. A guaranteed minimum price contract, that's a method of locking in a, you know, a portion of your clip um, for a set premium and then you still get to participate in the upside. So I still feel that's a, a good good way to go ahead uh, go ahead and you know you know where you stand from the get go of, of how it'll perform. And and then also the only only difficulty I say with forward selling is you've got to have it in quantities of about two and a half thousand kilos clean. So it's about twenty farm bales. So that may not appeal to everyone and you know, locking in your whole clip, you know, going ahead is probably you know, you should only look to look lock in thirty to fifty percent at any one time. So so that's a few things that discourage um, some people, uh, but yeah, anyway, talk talk to your wool broker, and I think that's the best thing. Just they, they're up to speed with what's going on, and got a got a feel for what's happening. So I think that's you know the best port of call. Um, yeah, so if you end up holding wool, because um, as we mentioned, hold, sitting on wool, and and it has been done. A lot of people have stored wool for a long time, and um, you know achieved a higher price per kilo. But yeah, if that which was if that was the outcome, that's worked well. Um, so yeah, technically, you know, technically call it backward selling and use options such as wool trade, and you know, you can passively act, act, act in the market. And that, once again, if you know what you want to achieve for your, you know, cents per kilo for your wool clip, it's a good way to go. Uh, if you've got other income coming in, uh, once again, if you've got to sell sheep and sheep, you know, the sheep market's really strong still, so that is generating a lot of income for people where traditionally that wasn't there when wool was everyone's major income, and, and sheep weren't worth a lot. Um, you know, you, you were forced to meet the market more often, um, but now that's changed. Um, yeah, the recovery time for the market is unknown, and that's all a factor of when, when we get recovered from coronavirus and gets going. So that, it could be a long road ahead, but I still feel confident that once, once we get there, everything will be, you know, pick up and improve. So yeah, that, that, that's the biggest uncertainty. Um, often a lot of brokers offer free storage. Any brokers I've worked for have offered, you know, up to six months free storage. But yeah, you know, just speak speak with your broker. And if you do store it in your shed at home, just probably check what insurances are on it. Um, most brokers have some sort of um, insurance for the wool on farm, but just just double check all that because you know we don't want anything to um, go wrong if you do end up hanging on the wool for an extended period. Um, and most wool brokers offer a, a shearing advance. So if you do need cash immediately or leading up to when you sell wool, I'm sure you could draw an advance to help pay bills. So, so it's, you know, a few strategies if you do end up holding wool. So. Um, but overall, what you know, um, when you know wool will recover and get going again. So and even at the moment, I've, I've done a few sums with clients and in my own family. You know, growing wool is still a profitable business at these levels. Um, it's just not as good as it was. And thankfully, the you know the droughts. Uh, has broken and we're not having got the feeding costs. Um, otherwise, that could make it pretty tricky. Um, focus, and you know, focusing on productivity, keeping your flock productive, I feel is one of the better ways to you know keep um, get, get things humming along. And you know, particularly while sheep numbers are down, we've definitely got to you know get productivity per head um, higher and, and improving all the time. Uh, maintaining your clip preparation. I know when wool prices often go down, people think they try and cut off, cut off cut staff and shearing sheds and uh, there was you know a lot of interest in in unskirted wool and, and the, the concept of doing that and you know shearing more often and minimal preparation but I feel to get full competition on your wool your wool has to be prepared adequately which means uh, still classing it and preparing it to to a code of practice standard which you know maximizing competition is you know the only way to guarantee you're getting the best best uh, return for for your clip uh, and part of that too is probably uh, and one one thing I um, talk to my clients regularly about is completing the national wool de declaration uh, correctly, which is like the national vendor declaration that you use for sheep and cattle. 
um, but filling it out properly. And regardless, uh, particularly around the mulesing status, regardless of what, what you do on farm, whether you're non mules, use pain relief, um, you've ceased mulesing, whatever, just make sure you fill it out and declare it properly. There's definitely evidence that's showing wool that is fully declared will receive, you know, more than undeclared wool, regardless of the mulesing status. And, you know, the premium, pre, premiums that were there for non mules wool on some lots have slowed down now, but, you know, that, that, that's an issue that'll, you know, definitely won't go away. So if you can run a flock, um, that way, there's probably, you know, there's potential there to, to, to do that. So, but, uh, at the end of the day, you've just got to make sure all the all the information that's in the bottom page is on the bottom part of the page is ma matched up with a mob number uh, relative to each mob of sheep, and every line of wool that you wish to sell at auction must have a mob number next to it. So, as you can see in the example here, we've got mobs one, two, and three, and each line, each fleece line in particular, because they're all going to auction, and even the lower lines, I've got. Um, a mob number against it, so it can have a fully declared um, status in the in the auction room. Um, so that's you know just just part of that, and that's just making sure people you know your wool's been prepared properly. You've got all your information there, and and the buyers, they, all that information is displayed in the catalogue, and they can they can see that. So um, yeah, it's just just a small thing to do that's quite easy and just part of um, you know being a professional wool grower. Right, I'm moving on to the next part of my presentation. Um, you know, just it's always a bit of a throwaway line, controlling what you can. But you know, at the end of the day, you've got even with um, the world and the situation it is, we're not all that heavily impacted on farm. Um, assuming you've got supplies of chemical and, and things like that still. Um, so luckily, the season has turned around. Um, I think it would be quite depressing if we were in the you know that sea, you know drought we were back in January still now, because it would make it pretty tough. Um, we learned a lot in the drought. I felt feeding sheep on our existing clients. Um, I, I feel we probably learned more about nutrition and feeding a sheep in the last two or three years than the previous 30. Um, so that, that, that was some good things there and we can carry them on. Um, yeah, so maintaining your productivity, which I, I believe, you know, condition score was, uh, is a big part of that. And a lot of people who, you know, keep condition score on sheep. Have done really well, and that you know just allows you to get your sheep up to your full potential and as productive as possible. Uh, yeah, with the break of the drought, obviously there's opportunities to restock. Uh, the store market is it still is red hot, um, so that's probably when you you know are restocking. Um, you've definitely got to do your sums on what you're buying, and you know working out where you do create a margin from from buying them in. And the wool market falling has has probably changed that a little bit. Uh, but you just got to factor that in and look at different things and look at different trading options, whether you're going a bit shorter term, uh, while you've got the feed feed on hand, um, and just, just making use of that green feed while it's there and just create, creating cash flow for your business, which is always important. Um, and once again, feed budgeting, like, yeah, you can look in the paddock and say, you, you know, I've got heaps of feed here, I'm never going to run out again, but you've still got to have a good budget on, on you know, a good handle on what, what feed you've got. Um, and past, pasture testing is still important to do is probably more so now because I think a lot of the feed due to the way it's grown and that is probably, um, dried off, gone, gone a little bit, uh, has lignified pretty quickly. So testing your feed is, is still just as important. Um, also remembering that you've got green feed challenges. Um, it's a lot better to have grass than have no grass, but with the mix of, uh, you know, herbages and different different plants that have grown. There are challenges there, particularly there's a high level of nitrates coming out of the drought and um, high level of, um, uh, you know, other minerals build up, sulphur and, and um, yeah, um, potassium and different things, which which is what a common, common occurrence um, when you, um, you know, come, come out of the drought. So, so, and you know, focusing on your mineral nutrition is part of that. Still maintaining your, you know, um, your green feed mix, so such as your calcium and magnesium, particularly if you're still coming up for lambing. Um, and there has been some issues that we identified as being vitamin A and probably leading into thiamine uh, B1. Some deficiencies there. So, so speak to your, you know, whoever you, you know, get to seek your livestock production advice off. And who, who you, you know, you probably all found, managed to speak to someone during the drought. So yeah, keep keep in touch with them and just you know keep an eye out for those things. So 
Um, and particularly vitamin A, it's probably a tricky one because you assume with a lot of green grass, we'd be getting it back again. And even um, I was a bit surprised at some of the issues we've seen just due to the vitamin A being broken down readily by the uh, what 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 has essentially been an overload of some you know other nitrates and that in the um, in the grass. So, um, but yeah, you do see a few tricky ones occasionally, like thiamine, which is vitamin vitamin B1. So, but anyway, just. Talk, talk to your best, you know, trusted advisor. Um, new knowledge is obviously we learn a lot during the drought, so now's the time to maintain it. Um, understanding your required nutrition levels. Um, so once again, energy, protein, um, minerals, vitamins, um, go on there. So still, still understand that. At the end of the day, you've still got to get enough energy in the system. So sheep can, you know, sheep and all livestock can maintain condition. Uh, I think scanning for multiples, that was one thing in the drought. A lot of people, you know, they were previously scanning, but not necessarily scanning for, for multiples or twins and separating them. But I feel it's, you know, trying to rebuild the flock with higher reproduction, that's the, you know, one of the first steps. And there's plenty of evidence showing there that that's the biggest opportunity a lot of people have got, um, assuming you, you, your scanning's going well. And that's where, once again, you've got to scan to work out where you stand. Uh, improved weaning practices, a lot of people, um, we're probably nearly we're forced into early weaning just as a way of reducing their feed demand and giving their ewes in, um, a chance to, to rebuild uh, condition levels and to reduce their feed bill. So and I, I feel a lot of people will, will keep doing uh, those practices such as yard weaning and, and weaning, you know, weaning earlier than they used to. So because essentially that's one of the best ways to reduce your feed demand and um, you know reduce your stocking rate. Is um, or well, or improve your carrying capacity. One way you want to look at it is through um, better weaning practices, um, and focus on each class of sheep. You've got to you know understand what the requirements are. If they're young and growing sheep, they need um, you know they, they need plenty of energy and protein. Where if they're just dry ewes uh, running around waiting to be joined, you can probably you know don't need as much. And then going on to a few running weathers or older older dry sheep, it's pretty right. Then obviously if you've got multiple bearing ewes coming into lambing. Um, you know, you've got to get all that stuff. You know, understand your energy levels and what, what's needed. So, as you can see here, year requirements. Um, you know, you've got three three sheep here: a dry sheep, a ewe, you know, a sheep uh, ewe with single a single lamb on board, and a ewe with twins on board. And as you can see here, the requirements just escalate uh, once you get very close to lambing. So, once again, you've got to understand that, and that that's there every year. So you still you still need to match what what you've got in the paddock with what um, what what the ewe needs. So, um, but yeah, that's a pretty good graph to explain that. So you know, focusing on that's still still a good thing. And even um, in these better better years with more feed on hand, people say you know scanning or splitting splitting the ewes up isn't justified. But as you can see there, there's a um, you know requirements vary so much. So that's why you've got to have a good handle on that. Um, yeah, so um, it, in feeding for production, I think that's one thing we learn in the drought. But you know, you have you've got to feed for production, and, and with the economics of it, the prices we're receiving for wool and for, for sheep and lamb were you know a lot higher than previous droughts. So um, you know that that changed everything. So you know, so and that's why now we want to maintain that production. So having a, adequate uh, paddock feed, we can assume that there's plenty there because of the rain and the feed we've grown and the low stocking rates due to everyone being lowly stocked. Uh, there's plenty of feed there, but, but you, you know, that, and that's just part of pasture testing and, and making sure you can quantify what, what you do have in the paddock. Um, and even, you know, get, get in touch with some, you know, the advisors you use to, to do that. And I, I try and help people do that where, where I can. So, uh, and then, you know, growth rate, putting weight on, on sheep and getting growth, particularly out of your young sheep and maiden news is, um, is crucial to getting, maintaining that lifetime productivity. And if you're trading stock, if you're doing a short term trade, you know, with lands and that, obviously putting weight on is, is where you've got to be. So, so just, you know, and once again, understand what, what requirements your stock have, you can, uh, hit those targets. And capitalise on the feed available. Like we've got some of the best feed and best um, quality feed, as well as quantity that we've seen for, for a very long time. Um, so make, making use of that, and you know, putting putting the you know highest priority mobs in the best paddocks is still still worthwhile. So, 
Uh, everyone's numbers are down. That, that's just a fact of what's what's happened. So ensuring the productivity of those sheep, you know, per head is, is the best way to keep you know keep productivity high in these tough times, in these you know rebuilding times as we come out of the tougher times. And building up condition, you know, a lot of a lot of sheep this year to the seasons, you know, they 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 did did get down in condition, and that was just the factor of the season and, and one of the one of the hardest droughts we've probably seen. So now's a chance to really build up condition and get that back on 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 your ewes in particular. Why why they've got a chance um, with with the extra feed available. So you know, yeah, you know, condition score is king. That was one sort of thing I found in the drought. It's something you got to we we just got to get better at. Um, you know, the value of a sheep are reducing your mortality rates and just getting as many ewes to stay productive and go through to that caster age um, time, whatever age that is, is worth so much because, you know, mutton that's still $6.80 a kilo, that makes a, you know, what what could be considered an old cracker ewe that was not much value once. Um, you know, it's not hard to get $100 plus dollars, um, if, if you keep the condition on them. Um, it drives reproduction, all the lots on ewe work, um, definitely shows that, and you know, maintaining you know condition score is the best way to do that. Uh, and that's a combination of things trying to maximise your lamb survival. Um, I feel a lot of the times we get we get sheep pregnant and get them in lamb, and you know, getting those lambs on the ground is is the biggest challenge. And one of the best ways to help do that is to minimise your ewe mortality because obviously, a, um, if a ewe dies lambing, she she dies as well as the lamb. So you know, if you reduce that ewe mortality, and as the little graph there shows, having the condition on the ewes pre lambing is by far the best way to to reduce your ewe mortality. And once again, that flows on to you having more more sheep to sell at the end of their productive life, or whenever you 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 offload your ewe ewes, um, and allows you to also put more pressure on genetically because you've got more replacements. So. Um, and then joining, joining, you know, most of the time I feel joining does go pretty well. But if they're gaining condition through joining, that's that's the best way to be, um, to to get that humming along and being that you know, condition score three plus. And gaining is um, your best way to maximise conception rates. Um, but yeah, once again, condition score is, um, yeah, the most important thing you can do for managing your shoot. I feel. Uh, and that that flows into realising your potential. Everyone focuses, you know, heavily on their genetics. And getting that right, but you know we've definitely in the merino side improving your weaning rates is a, um, a big, big part of what what we've got to do, both from a profitability point of view, but just a you know flock rebuilding um, point of view, getting getting more lambs on the ground. And if you do want to focus on meat production, or you already focus on meat production, well, weaning rate is is one of your key profit drivers. So you know that's it applies to everyone. Uh, keep your young sheep or your weaners. You know the merino gets a bit of a bad rap for being wanting to die and and all these um, derogatory comments. But you know that that I think that's a factor of management as much as anything. And you just got to have your weaners going forward all the time. Great, you know, gaining weight, picking up, and then growing and getting them fully grown out um, as soon as you can. And that's the with the season we've got presented in front of us. We've got an opportunity to do that. And you know, growing your weaners out. We've learned. With the better nutrition and better feeding methods, I think we can do that in most years. And that flowing on the land is growing well. That I feel sets your maiden ewes up really well. You can have them fully grown uh, in in top condition, ready ready for joining. You can get you know getting as many maiden ewes in lamb and having a lamb will be very important for anyone trying to rebuild a flock um, this you know in the coming years. So you've definitely got to set set them up well and do that. Um, and if you want to get high growth. You can have all the high growth genetics in the world, but unless you've got high nutrition to match it, um, you, you've got to do that right. And that all comes down to management and getting that right. And you know, a lot, a lot of you know, some some of the merinos are being considered to be low low growth, but I think if you give them the right nutrition, they can they can hum along. And and a lot of the you know, some of the merino genetics now are, are really focused on growth, so you've got to match the nutrition. And once again, if you, your meat focus, prime lamb focus, that's that's your next big thing after weaning rate. Right? And and rebuilding with reproduction, I feel that is the best way forward for the industry to improve improve what we do and get more lambs on the ground. Um, and, and the value that surplus sheep are going to be worth going ahead, particularly uh, merino ewes that are, are surplus for you, but they're, they're going to be worth you know a lot of money. And um, there's plenty of you know there's some programs I'm involved in and 
you know, people have crunched the numbers on what, what they think their ewes are worth in their flock. Um, and, you know, the average is, I think it was $326 we worked out the other night. Um, so that's a, you know, pretty, pretty valuable uh, commodity to be involved in. And, um, and just understanding all those factors that drive production. Um, you know, do, doing the numbers on how you work out, you know, make sure it's the number of lambs weaned that you use joined. Um, because at the end of the day, that, that's what the bottom line is. So, um, you know, that, that's what we've got to focus on. Uh, going ahead and what we can learn doing that now, when we really have to, I think will also set us up for better management down the track. So, um, as you can see there, lamb survival, which I think is in particular in the twin, in the twin, twin bearing ewes is the biggest, you know, uh, potential, um, game changer that we've got. So, and as you can see there, it's pretty clear cut. You condition score at lambing drives that. Um, and also has an influence on your single lamb. So, you know, looking after your ewes and keeping them in in top condition is by far and away the best best thing we can do um, coming coming out of the seasons we've had. So, um, so in summary, just a few areas I feel you can focus on, and this is what I speak to my clients about, and um, and do in my own family business. Um, I think, yeah, understanding your cost of production. Um, you know, costs are always rising. Costs are, you can't, there's just a lot of costs in sheep you can't avoid. So you've got to have a good handle on what they are. And, um, there's so many opportunities within the merino enterprise and a sheep flock because you've got so many products you can produce knowing what, um, you know, what, what you can do and which enterprises work for you and the costs involved is, is, you know, key to, to key to unlocking the, you know, benefit the bet the opportunity in your business, uh, and also gives an opportunity to lock in wool prices because I feel you know forward selling wool is one one thing unique due to the low risk um, in the production of, of of wool. So if you know what you need to achieve for it, you can start forward marketing. So um, once again, improving your productivity, as I've mentioned plenty of times. Uh, but yeah, understanding your production numbers and particularly around your lamb survival and mortality rates. Um, so having you know scanning. Having some really good figures on, you know, recording of the numbers around scanning and, and your ewe mortality um, gives you a good guide on what's going on. And then you can identify where to focus um, um, your efforts and, and your time and, and money. So um, it's essentially just grab, grabbing the low hanging fruit. So, and then that flows on. If you're going to really bump up your productivity and, and improve your, um, you know, lamb survival and, and those areas, you've got to, yeah, once again, know the nutritional requirements of of all your classes of stock um, to maximise their potential. And particularly if you're trying to, you know, hit um, target, you know, weights, um, get them firing along, you've got to focus on that. And, and you know, continuing to improve weaning rate, rates is the one way we can really rebuild the flock. So, um, yeah, so anyway, that's, um, that's just a few key areas. And, and they're all different to each person. And, they, and those priorities might be different too. That's not in any order. They're yeah, just the way I put it together, but but I think by doing all three will get you a fair way. So, um, and at the moment, you know, obviously the world's moved a lot of online training, and you know, there's nearly a webinar every day, so there's plenty of opportunity to learn, um, you know, learn learn some new things, and and in break, and particularly coming out of the drought, we've got a good we've got a blank canvas in a lot of respects. So, um, and there's always going to be people that speculate things, but getting to the bottom of what's going on is uh, the best way forward to learn. So, um, so anyway, thank, thanks everyone for coming on, and um, yeah, we'll have a bit of time now for questions, and yeah, my contact details are there, so don't be afraid to get in touch at, at any time. So, um, thank you. I'll hand back to you, Kate. Thanks, Brett. Um, I thought I'd just take the opportunity to um, note that final image. We've had a question come through, which which asks, "Did Carol Baskin kill her husband?" So, uh, yeah, that was quite timely that one. But um, in all yeah. seriousness, that was a <laughs> that, that guy looks pretty trustworthy, so I think you can uh, trust him. Um, and for those of you who haven't um, watched that series, it, I don't think you're missing out on much. But anyway. Um, so that was an excellent pre presentation. Thank you, Brett. I really appreciate your time. I also appreciate everyone's time for, for listening in um, and hopefully you got something out of it. One thing that I'll probably pick up on and like you said, like there's at the moment we have an opportunity to sort of capitalise on what we have, you know, available to us 
in regards to feed. So our feed base has hopefully picked up in comparison to other points of time. So yeah, use this to capitalise on, on that feed base and, and strategies such as scanning for multiples and um, splitting your management system based on those results and really focusing on your lambing environment because I think it's a time now that we want to we want to make the most out of that and yeah the more lambs on the ground the better and really you know utilize what we have so that was excellent thank you Brett um, some questions that we've had come through which I'll just um, start with so we've had we've had one which is you know a bit has been topical for quite some time but um, coming from Tim and he just said do you think we're going to see an increased demand for non mules wool um yeah i think you know over time i think there will be uh particularly at that higher end um uh, you know and in the you know in the wool the wool you know those specialty wool types i feel there will be an increase there um and i think yeah at, it will increase over time and i think and, and two the mulesing story it's, you know non-mulesing is one part of it but the provenance and the story around wool i think the the demand for that's increasing so it's a, it's a two-pronged thing um, but yeah, no, I, you know, once we get through the current um, you know, coronavirus situation, I think you know we'll see a bit of that start going again. Um, it is hard to know. It is. I still feel the demand is a bit, bit thin or a bit, you know, up and down. It's not always there. Um, but but there definitely are markets there, and and I think some of those accreditation programs um, are definitely worth worth looking at if, if you're not using and, and and doing that, you've definitely got to declare it and sell your story. Um, yeah, it's got to, the message has got to get through to you know what 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 you what you do on farm and what what your um, what your current meals and status is. So I, I think that's the best way forward to you know make, you know when the demand um, does come again. Yep. Um, so and we've had another question come through, which is quite a good one from Tim. Also, as a new entry into the sheep industry, is it economical, and would you recommend running weathers? I think the best part of weathers is just the low input, the low labour requirement, and that is a, the biggest factor, or the, one of the biggest barriers, I think, to sheep is, is that labour requirement because you've got to be onto it. Obviously, the Walmart, like weathers as a proposition on their own, has been very viable for the last couple of years. Uh, the wool market's coming back, and they, even my own family, we, we, we run a lot of weathers um, and always have, and I, I did the sums on it only. About 10 days ago, because I was a bit concerned with the way the wool market had come down. Uh, the margins have tightened up a bit, particularly if you're buying them in due to the high store market. But but I, I think they're yeah they're still viable, um, and due to just the low low input and probably the carrying capacity, you can run a lot of weathers. Um, like I I feel you can one, run three weathers in the place of one breeding ewe. So I say it's a way of creating scale growing wool. Um, and obviously, you know, once you wool, with weathers, you've got to be, you, you've got to maintain your wool cuts and maintain your productivity. And also, if you've got country that you can't do much else with, um, it's still pretty handy um, in income. So, so yeah. Long story short, I'd say yes, um, but probably not quite as handy as it was only a couple of months ago. Yep. No worries. Um, we've had a question come in from Lachlan. Um, do, do you recommend a production cost calculator tool? Uh, yeah, there's a couple. I um, MLA have got one. I haven't used it much, but I've used the AWI one probably for the wool side. Um, so they're they're all pretty good. Um, and just I, I've sort of gone using you know using a lot of spreadsheets just just on my own or put together. Um, but but yeah, there, there are a couple there. I think I think they're all equal and, and a bit like anything, rubbish in, rubbish out. It's just putting in your figures and you know and, and getting a guide on what changes and just the variables that impact it. So um, yeah, but probably I'm more familiar with the wool one from AWI, so probably yeah, recommend that one. So. And what what one's that, Brett? Oh, the AWI Australian Wool Innovation. Yeah. The wool yep. cost so production. Is there some the like can, can people access on that on the website or something? Is it? Where yeah, you yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure we can. Yeah, if you just yep. Googled, yeah, Googled uh, wool cost of production, it it had come up. So. Yep, no worries. Um, so yeah, I probably that one's probably a bit similar 
practiced with the, any management tools or applications, which is probably along that line. Um, we've had another question uh, come in from... Oh, yeah, no, I'll just, yep. just on, on yep. that. Yeah, now there's a couple of good apps, uh, like Lifetime U Management. I've got an app, and that's really good for recording your condition scoring. Um, and so does the... I think it's the, the WA Department of Ag. They've got a good good app there, and they've also got a one that's called a Lambing Planner, which is really good for working out a program yeah. and, and throwing around a few different dates. Um, yeah. So they're they're, they're yeah. pretty good too, so just as a basic one. Um, yeah, the AWI condition scoring one's really excellent to keep on top of your condition scoring, and it makes it quite a fluent thing when you're in the yard trying to do that. So. Um, uh, and then we've had one come in from Norm. So, how much does it cost to scan? Um, normally, um, it's about. I think if you're doing twins, probably about eighty-five to ninety cents. I think a standard wet and dry is about seventy-five. But I, I sort of feel if you're going to the effort to get them used in the yards, uh, you do do the twins. So, but yeah, around around that eighty-five to ninety cents. Yep, no worries. So we've had one coming from Amber. Just wondering if there are any strategies for dealing with wedgetail eagles at lambing time. Do crow scares work? Um, I think they do to a degree, but I think they they can adapt to what's going on. Um, so yeah, it is a is a tricky one, but yeah, I think anything to deter them, uh, yeah, would would help. Um, but yeah, they are, are an ongoing issue, and I know there is some research being done in Victoria to look into some ways of trying to get get on top of that because it is a, obviously a pretty sensitive topic. Um, but I think just a lot of the time too, if you've got a bit of presence in the paddock, checking your ewes without disturbing them too much, you can you can sort of get a gauge on what's going on um, and doing those things, and even you know basic things like. Um, uh, putting some dead carcasses of, um, you know, other feral animals or, or anything else around and just, you know, having something to draw them away is a big thing. Um, obviously, you've been proved, you know, and if you can, have your use, you know, you know, as strong as you can and having some um, solid, solid lambs, that I think that goes a fair way too. So, um, but yeah, no, that that is a tricky one and one even you know, with exclusion fencing and different things for other baiting for other predators, it is hard to, hard to handle. Yeah, no worries. So um, our last question that's come in is from Hugh, and he's just asked your opinion on all-in clips in the current market. Oh, as in um, skirted, I assume? Like fibre direct? I would assume so. Would assume yeah. so. yeah, they're probably like, yeah, they're probably ones that are feeling it the most um, because of the, and particularly depending on the wool and the amount of BM. Any any wool that's not testing well is probably copping the brunt of the market. Um, so obviously there's a cost saving by not not you know by by throwing everything in the press and not not skirting. But I think they're the ones that are you know copping it the most. So um, in in a strong wool market, you can get away with a lot of things. But in a in a poor wool market, you've got to have everything Mickey Mouse to get get full competition. You may be getting less per kilo, and you definitely will be now. You know, if you started going back to skirting, but compared to you know, um, yeah, to get full competition, you've got to have your wool prepared um, as well as you can. Yep, no worries. All right. Well, if there weren't any other questions, um, we might um, pull it up there. So. Thank you everyone for taking the time to, to listen in tonight. And again, thanks to Brett for a really excellent presentation. It's good to, to catch up on what's happening in the, the sheep and wool industry. And yeah, um, it's handy to hear some of the tips that you had to say in that regard. Um, one thing I will comment on is just when you mentioned, you know, it's the, the emphasizing, um, talking about like, you know, feed testing, I, I guess, like we've all been dealing with that for you know with the when we've been lacking that feed base for quite some time but don't don't lose sight in and just really knowing what what you know what you're feeding because the emphasis is on that nutritional aspect and we do still have some free feed te tests available at local land services so there's myself and Tim's um, so Tim's another livestock officer 
typically based out in Warrialda. Um, there's our email addresses or the offices if you are interested in, in taking a feed test depending what you've got, um, what you're grazing at the moment, but that's definitely available. But other than that, um, yeah, that, that's about it. Um, thank you once again, and hopefully you've got something out of it. We, I'll, you will get an email with the survey. Um, everyone loves filling out a survey, I know, um, but it's much appreciated. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, stay safe amongst the coronavirus at the moment, and, and we look forward to hearing from you um, at our next webinar. So thanks, Brett, and thanks, everyone. No worries. Thanks, Kate.